Okay. So, hi everybody. Thank you for uh, uh, coming to this talk. I'm going to uh, report on a challenge that we did with the DREAM and NC the NCI uh, on predicting drug synergy. Um, so, first, let's talk a little bit about synergistic interactions between drugs. Um, the reason why people and, and um, doctors are in need for this kind of um, um, cocktail therapy is because we need to uh, reduce the resistance to treatment that uh, almost inevitably targeted therapy eventually uh, uh, creates. The, after time of re uh, remittance, uh, the cancers tend to relapse improve the overall survival or decrease the compound, the independent compound, compound dose. The uh, mechanisms of actions of drug combinations are, are various and uh, uh, could be two drugs acting on the same molecule, like for example, trastuzumab, which is Herceptin and Lapatinib, that both act on her, her two, uh, for HER2 positive breast cancer patients, uh, acting on the same pathway, for example, uh, all acting on DNA damage repair or acting in different pathways synergistically, for example, uh, on, on uh, DNA damage and uh, cell cycle. So there is no one way of doing it. There are more ways of uh, interactions that we don't know. And uh, most importantly, in order to uh, be translationally useful, um, it is necessary to do a screening of a lot of combinations that probably are synergistic, but we don't know. And in order to do that, you have to combine pairs, um, triplets, of uh, lots of drugs. And if you have 1,000 drugs and you do N square, you will have 1 million. So it doesn't make sense. You have to get some way of prioritizing this by using um, some in silico ways. And uh, so basically the dream challenge was set up in order to try to um, benchmark uh, methods to do these kinds of um, uh, uh, triaging of, of the possible uh, n square problem. And um, um, in a way, we are not trying to predict compounds. We are trying to find methods that do predict compounds that uh, work synergistically. So the challenge was um, right in 2012, actually the same year that uh, the challenge that um, Robert just uh, mentioned, the, the Press for Life uh, ALS challenge. This challenge. Um, was more or less organized as follows. We, we had 14 drugs for which we had some dr data, and uh, we made all the combinations of these 14 drugs, which are 91 combinations, and we asked, uh, we asked participants, can you rank the combinations from the most synergistics to the least synergistic? And eventually, because we had the measure of which ones were the most synergistics, we could evaluate the predictions. All these were done on one cell line, this diffuse large uh, B cell lymphoma cell line called uh, LY3. So the data was pretty rich, very interesting data set, um, uh, unique at the time that uh, it was provided. We had uh, three time points for which we have um, uh, gene expression arrays, we had three replicates per time point, and we had um, uh, two uh, concentrations in which we uh, gave them. And uh, the, we gave the doc dose response for the individual monotherapies, and we gave um, a genomic. So, by the by, the way, the gene expression data was for before treatment and after treatment, and uh, we also had the copy number uh, uh, variant variation uh, of the cell line as well as the single nucleotide polymorphisms for that same uh, cell line. So we gave all this data, and we asked uh, participants, "Can you predict?" Uh, which are the synergistic genes. How do we measure synergy? This is a little bit of a contentious um, subject in the field. There are many ways of measuring synergy. There is no one best way. It depends on what you want to ask of the system. Uh, we use uh, what is called excess over bliss independence. Uh, if you call V the viability, that means the fraction of surviving, surviving cells after uh, treating the cells, and I the inhibition, which is basically uh, one minus the viability, the fraction that was inhibited. So bliss independence, that means assuming that the two drugs are not, synergist, not synergistic, basically can be thought probabilistically as the fraction, the probability that a cell survives with two uh, drugs is the probability that it survives with one drug times the probability that it survives with the other. We are not saying that this is the way uh, it has to be computed. This is 
the baseline over which, if we have more or less viability, we want to call uh, the drug combinations synergistic or antagonistic. Another way of doing it, and it's useful for, uh, for the next slide, so I want to say is basically do one minus uh, the viability of the pair, call it IAB, and that can be interpreted as the probability of being inhibition, inhibited by one drug plus the probability that is inhibited by the other given that it was not inhibited by the first. And so we will discuss this in a second. Basically, what we are trying to do a little bit more graphically is if we have the drug response and we have a, a given dose, which is called the IC20 concentration, the concentration at which each, each of the two drugs has 20% inhibition, we estimate what is the bliss additivity. And if we have more inhibition, we say that the two drugs are synergistic. And if we have less inhibition, we say that the two drugs are antagonistic. One goes against the other. So basically, the excess over bliss is the inhibition that results from the pair minus the inhibition that you would expect if they were independently acting. The measurements of this, um, of this um, um, excess over bliss is not one number, it's several numbers. If you do replicates, you will have an error. So therefore, we had to take into account when we score the fact that we don't have a unique possible value that if people rank things differently, it may be a probability that that different ranking is probably uh, going to be measured if we redid the experiment. So we had into account that, and we define what is called the probabilistic concordance index, which is like the concordance index, but under the uh, uh, fact that the gold standard is noisy. The concordance index, by the way, is the proportion of pairs of cell lines, so not of cell lines here, of, 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 of drug pairs, this was for another challenge, whose excess over bliss order was correctly predicted. So if I say that this drug pair is more synergistic than this other drug pair, uh, and this is the true, then I get a brownie point. If it is false, then uh, I get subtracted uh, uh, value. And so the, the fraction of correct answers are the ones that con contribute to the concordance index. So what was the result? So if we assume that the predictions were random, that basically that everybody was sending monkeys were predicting basically and so the order of the pairs were uh, random you will have a null distribution and if you put on that null distribution the uh, concordance index uh, probabilistic concordance index resulting from uh, the submissions we had kind of span all the support of this distribution indeed some were kind of anti-correlated but there were three that seem to be uh, in the tail of the distribution and with a false uh, discovery rate less than 0.05. This is quite far from where we would like to be. This is the best possible result that we could have gotten. Remember that the gold standard is noisy, so we don't have one concordance index, but 0.9. So I like to think that either the, the glass is half empty, for this guy is half, half empty, for this guy is half full. And, and I would like to say it's half full in the sense that this gives us the sense that there is signal to be found and um, remember this, uh, and Robert alluded to this, if, if we did it in a, for our own alg algorithms, most likely we will find a way to make it much better. But this is blind predictions. So this is the reality probably of what the community can do um, today. So I wanted to discuss a little bit what the, um, um, the best performer did. So what they were thinking, remember that we had said, and now I changed notations to match the notation of the best performers, this, this group, Digre, uh, sorry, the group was a uh, young CS lab from uh, uh, UT Southwestern, but at the algorithm they call it Digre. Um, so they are thinking, well, if the inhibition of the pair is like the inhibition, the, the probability of being inhibited by one plus the probability of being inhibited by the other, given that it was in, not inhibited by one, they thought, why don't we think of this as a sequential process in which we start giving one drug, suppose you give A, and you kill the fraction FA of, of cells, and then the ones that are not there, you add B, the other, the other drug. And you have to think how B is acting in the context of A having been active. And uh, so the idea is there, you have the gene expression profiles, you um, 
you decide uh, on some bio prior knowledge what are the genes that you're going to use and you see what um, some sort of similarity score between the the um, um, the two drugs whether one created a differential expression that was consistent with the other drug or anti-consistent with the other drug you create how similar how similar these two drugs are and this is containing this similarity score r you also have the drug response curves and then you think well i know fa right with well, the inhibition of that because i have the drug response but that drug in the context of the other drug could be fully aligned with the uh, with the um, with the other drug in its action and therefore it's as if i had uh, uh, two times the second drug or could not be aligned in which case in which case i will i will i will will have a fraction of the other drug um, contribution. If you think of this in that way, then the, the viability of uh, the second drug in the presence of the first drug could be factored in this way. This is a mathematical model to do that. So there are many ways to do this. This is how they chose to do it. And they have a final inhibition that they can subtract to the bliss independence and get a result. And that's how they, they modeled it. It's important to note that there was no training set here. This was pure mathematical modeling. So we didn't give a training set in which we said, this is how two drugs actually interact with each other. They only had the monotherapy. So uh, another way of looking at the scoring of these challenges, take the most synergistic, the least synergistic or, or antagonistic, and forget about these additive ones, which are in the middle. And how do people do when it comes to um, predicting the the uh, the synergistic on one side, the synergistics are these ones. So this is what you expect by chance, and the antagonistic, which are these ones. And interesting, interestingly, the the dots are statistical significant with respect to the dotted lines. Everybody that was statistically significant with respect to either antagonism or synergism was not significant with respect to the other. So, for example, the best performers were quite synergistic, quite, quite good at predicting antagonism, but almost random at predicting synergism. And the ones that were good at predicting synergism, for example, these guys, were almost random at predicting antagonism. Except for the wisdom of crowd solution, the aggregate of them all, that were significant in both counts. This, this will uh, give us something to think in terms of predicting synergism or antagonism seems to be having different uh, mechanisms. Okay, so let's move on to uh, some of the work that I am doing in my lab that, that came as a result of what I learned from the challenges, um, which is the following. What does synergism mean at the molecular level? So uh, in, at the transcriptional level. So let's fill one blank that we had, which is that we knew the gene expression after one drug after the other, but we didn't know what happens with this gene expression after you put the two drugs. We didn't have the transcriptional profile in that case. By the way, I use um, three drugs, T, M, and the combination T, M, and M, W is the same M as this one, and the combination. In, you can see here the viability as a function of time, we measure the viability in time, was such that uh, T and M didn't really change the viability much. The excess over bliss predicted is this, but actually, the real viability is plummeting. That means these drugs are really synergistic. Each one by themselves don't do anything, but the two together kill the cells big time. Whereas these guys uh, have the M that, that doesn't do much, W that does something, and the combination that does almost the same as W. So let's see what, what, what do we have at the level of gene expression. This is just a, a tip of the iceberg uh, analysis. If you look at TM, that were the very synergistic ones, T had some differential expressed genes and some differential expressed genes for M. But when you put T and M together, you have a lot new stuff that it seems to be very hard to be predicted by the independent action of each of the drugs in principle, but we are trying to do it anyway. And this trend grows in time. And you know, we have, I can see it here, but you know, 2000 genes that seem to be differential expressed here, whereas we have hundreds here. And uh, the same is true for M, uh, the different is true from MW, which there seems to be a clear dam dominance of W. All the differentially expressed genes for uh, MW are basically the same as W. 
So you see that there is a huge overlap in the combination with one of the drugs. So it's interesting that at the transcription level, there is more that meets the eye than, than what we did for the, uh, thank you, for the dream challenge. So basically what this is saying is synergistic activity of a gene might occur, uh, something new when you put the two drugs, when you have, for example, a gene that is downstream of two transcriptional regulators and one transcriptional regulator is working only for one drug and the other on the other. But this guy needs the two. And if that's the case for those genes, the combination will do something that none of the individual ones could, uh, could do. And that's what we can see when we do the uh, differential expressed in the co uh, combo. Good. So uh, what's next? We have, um, as, as uh, Robert pre uh, presented, the new LS2, LS, ALS certification challenge. We are going to do an AstraZeneca Sanger drug combination prediction dream challenge, which is three years after the uh, last one. We are increasing the scale, going from 91 combinations to 13,000, provided by AstraZeneca, and going from one cell line to um, 79 cell lines. Uh, not just of um, B cells, but also of breast, but, but of breast, lung, and in the GI tract. And what is different is that while before we were doing gene expression data before and after treatment, now we don't do g give gene expression data only basal, and we also give copy number variation, mutations, and so on. We give a training set and the leaderboard, and we ask for, to predict, which before we didn't have neither training set nor leaderboard. So we don't have the before and after, but we have other things and much more uh, scaled up. And finally, what are we asking? While in Dream 7, we asked to rank synergy scores. In Dream 10, we are going to predict synergy scores, given a drug which added agents lead to the highest synergy, and given a cell line, which combination is the most synergistic. And if you are interested to pre-register, you can go to dreamchallenges.org, upcoming challenges, and that's where you will be able to pre-register. So conclusions. For the DREAM7 Drug Synergy Challenge, we had, in three months, about 90 researchers from the 31 teams that participated. This would be about 23 persons years. That means we accelerated research by that amount. This is the way we can think of doing challenges. We are right, not just finding the best. We are really making a push in the research in the field. Prediction is possible without the training set. That, that seems to be the, uh, what the, our DREAM7 Challenge says. Uh, but methods that are good at predicting synergy seem to be bad at predicting antagonism and vice versa. We may need to model both independently. Transcriptomic-based synergy prediction needs a molecular understanding of where the novelty emerges at the single gene level. That's something that we couldn't see before, and new experiments need to be done. And we have the new drug combo challenge that uh, will uh, open up probably uh, later in the summer. Lots of people part participate in DREAM. Sage Bio Networks uh, has a, a very important participation. Uh, my folks at IBM, University of Colorado, Jim Costello, Oregon Health and Science University, Joe Gray and Laura Heiser, the NCI, Columbia University, where the data from the Synergy Challenge came, AstraZeneca, and the NCI Dream Community. Thank you. So are there any questions? Well, you know, what we are seeing is that what we call targets, the molecular target, for example, erlotinib has EGFR or Herceptin has uh, HER2, probably is not the right way to think in general when we do drug co combinations because there is a lot of functional changes that occur after that and there are molecular targets that can be inferred from the transcriptional changes. And I think that that's going to be more uh, specific than the target that sometimes is not uh, unique or, or, you know, it's a little bit dirty. So, buddy, are you giving that information to the challenge or is it just Definitely. There are algorithms to, um, to, def uh, to infer new, tar new molecular targets uh, that are working very well with transcriptional data, and, uh, and that's, that's happening, yeah.